Hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, it's gonna be another December video. On last week's video, if you haven't seen it yet, I'll put a link in the description, you should check that out first. But I looked at this leading edge computer here that I found at a recycling center, and people seem to really like that video. And I showed this little mini tower machine, which I had picked up at the same time, saved it from being scrapped, and I thought maybe I would take a look at it if people were interested. And I had lots of comments where people said that they wanted to see what this machine was all about. So in this video, we're gonna take a look at this. Now, in case you weren't familiar with December, it is the month of December. So myself and some other YouTubers decided to get together and make videos specifically around PCs that run DOS, thereabouts. There's no hard and fast rules, but um, check out the links in the description to the other participating channels. Or of course, you can search for the hashtag December in YouTube and you'll find um, other participants, uh, other people making videos that aren't necessarily in the participant list because of course, it's open to everyone. And one more thing to mention before I clear off the bench to work on this machine, I want to talk about this thing right here on the turntable. What it is, is a memory tree and it's holding a lot of the RAM that I have gotten from various mail call episodes, which is why Rami is out enjoying his little Christmas time next to the memory tree. This was sent in by a viewer and I just assembled it today and put all the RAM on it and I think it looks absolutely adorable. It's a super cute way to display all the RAM that I've gotten. Anyhow, without further ado, let's get right to it. So, the early 90s PC built into a mini tower case. Yes, I'm using LGR's voice there. So yeah, look at this thing. I think some people had commented that they have this exact case or they had this exact case back in the day. And you know what? I used to work in a computer store in high school. This was in the early 90s. And absolutely, I built many a machine into this exact case. So I think it was pretty prolific. Let's examine the front here. So starting from the top, we have a five and a quarter inch floppy drive, probably a 1.2 megabyte version. Then we have a CD-ROM drive. But as some people had pointed out, this is a very interesting one. And actually, yes, I have experienced these when I worked in that computer store. But what's different about this than other early CD-ROM drives is the entire drive comes out. And watch, to eject the disk, you push in it, let go, and then you slide the entire mechanism out and lift it up. Taking a look inside, you'll see this reminds you of the original PlayStation where the spindle is right there and you clip the disc right onto there. And when you're done, you close the lid and then you slide this back into the case just like that. And yes, if you have headphone jack or whatever connected right there, it's gonna come out with the entire unit. The benefit of a mechanism like this though meant that you didn't need to use a CD caddy, which was very typical at the time for other CD-ROM drives. I just happen to have a caddy CD-ROM drive right here. So essentially this has a slot and you have to take the CD and stick it into a CD caddy. I'm sorry, I don't have one handy right now and slide that into the mechanism. So unfortunately, if you didn't have the caddy handy, you weren't gonna be able to use that CD. So this drive gave you an alternative to having to use caddies. Under the CD-ROM drive, we have a standard three and a half inch floppy drive. There is the power switch. Now this is a hard power switch because this is an AT motherboard. There's no soft power on or off. So the 120 volts or 240 volts mains actually comes right to the back of this switch and you interrupt or give power to the power supply itself. It has a flying lead that comes out of it. And then this switches both the live and the neutral to the power supply. Next up, we have the small panel here, which gives you a key lock, a turbo switch, a reset button, there are a series of LEDs along the top. What does it look like? Power, turbo, and hard drive. And then most likely behind this little blank area here was a two digit numeric display. So you could show 66 megahertz for your 4D6, or when you push turbo, it would change to say 33. Now it was very fiddly to adjust this thing and it was also optional. So not all of the cases actually came with that numeric display. Because I'm impatient, I'm gonna shine a flashlight in there and see if I can see the display, and I cannot. So I have a feeling that there is no display in this machine. Next, we have a red Intel Inside sticker, and I don't think they gave these out with 4D6s. So 
This leads me to believe that there's probably a Pentium in this machine. And then we have a case badge, and this would have been blank with the case when you first bought it, and then the case or the computer builder could stick their own sticker on there. And yes, back in high school, that's what we did. We had stickers made up that fit this space here, and we could put our own sticker. I'm really impressed by this badge. This is actually a metal badge. It has a raised lettering where the K is, and it's just classy looking. K for classy? Classy with a K? Hmm. Anyhow, pretty nice. And not much else to report on the front, just some stylish lines here, which probably double duty as air intake as well for this case. Airflow back in the day was not something that case manufacturers put a lot of effort into. Computers were loud, they had lots of fans in them, and they just tried to get air through every little nook and cranny, like in through your disk drives and stuff like that. So ultimately the situation we're in now with good airflow in cases is a huge improvement from the stuff back in the day. I have this on the 70s towel for easy rotation. On this side of the case, of course, we got nothing, just a few little minor scratches, but nothing too bad. It is all metal on the sides. This front bezel is plastic, but it actually, as you see, has not yellowed too much. There's a little bit of yellowing on the plastic on the sides of the CD-ROM drive, and but otherwise, I gotta say, this thing has survived the years pretty good. This side of the case is looking pretty good, just a few minor scuffs and scratches, but pretty good otherwise. And now to the business end of this computer, where we can get a reveal on what we might get and find inside of this thing. Starting at the top, we have a very standard AT power supply. And I have to tell you that the ATX power supplies we use today in 2020 are basically the same form factor of this original power supply design. I'm not sure who came up with this particular form factor, but essentially, I think you can mount this into a modern case and you can take an ATX power supply and mount it into here. There may be some issues with the way this metal is right here, but I think the four screw holes are exactly the same. Now you'll notice the mains IEC power input. There's also an IEC power output and that's for connecting your monitor, speakers, whatever. You could connect a little power strip into that thing and uh, it would turn on and off with the front power switch on the case. Moving down inside this hole here is the AT keyboard connector. Right here you see some blanks that you can knock out to add extra 25 pin and nine pin connectors. So if you didn't wanna use up space in your slots here to have like serial ports, you could take them off of that little slot bracket and move them up into this upper area. You have to just punch those out. And here are the expansion cards. So anywhere you see these sort of blue gray ones, these are just slot covers, so there's no card installed there. So from the top down, we have a modem, we have a sound card that has an integrated game port. We have a multi IO card that has a game port and a serial port, 25 pin. And then here we have a nine pin serial port and a parallel port. Now, because this one is sort of loose ish, I can tell that this is just a slot cover that has these two connectors in it. And the cables run most likely to this card, which probably has the floppy controller and the hard drive controller on it as well. And then we have the VGA card down here. And I notice it's missing its little nuts that hold the card into the slot cover. Probably those came off with the monitor whenever someone removed the monitor that was connected to this computer at some point. So one thing that appears to be missing is the interface card for that CD-ROM drive. CD-ROM drive on the front is not IDE based and it originally came with a card that had audio output jacks on it. And that's what you use to get that thing working. Since that's not in here, it probably is connected to the sound card Maybe this is a sound blaster, and some of these sound blasters had extra connectors on them for hooking up to the proprietary CD-ROM drives. This one may be a Mitsumi drive, if I remember correctly, and some sound blasters have a Mitsumi 40-pin connector on it. It looks like IDE, but it's not. And there's also like a Panasonic, I think a Sony standard that are not IDE, they're proprietary, which originally required their own interface card, or you needed a card like a sound card that could have the support for it. And the last thing of note is this sticker here. It looks like it comes from the System Builder, Computer Technology Link Corporation, made in Oregon. And they added a serial number and an FCC ID. So like what, they actually had this whole computer certified by the FCC? That seems a bit crazy because this case was a generic case that you could just buy and assemble your own parts. And when you do that, it's never, never really FCC certified, right? You have to go through that entire process. So that's pretty surprising that there is a number there and there's an FCC warning that's partially obscured, but yeah, fascinating. Also interesting is that sticker on the front with a K ink. 
doesn't seem to coincide with this label at all. You'd think it would say CTL Corp or something on the sticker, but it doesn't. So that's basically it for the outside of the case. Now, before I turn this on, I wanna open this up and take a look inside just to make sure everything is looking correct. So now's the time for you to put your guesses in the comment section below on what you think this computer has inside. Is it a 486? Is it a Pentium? When is it from? What year? Things like that. And what kind of sound card is in here, so to speak, that allows that CD-ROM drive to work? Or how is that CD-ROM drive working? Anyhow, we're gonna find out right now. So it uh, has a capability of six screws on the back. It's only got two in the middle. I wonder if someone's been in here and pillaged parts out of it. We just don't know, right? Like I said, this was just on a stack of stuff ready to be recycled, and I did not take a look inside or anything. We just lift off the case, and there is our first glimpse inside the computer. And in typical 90s fashion, it is a bit of a mess. Now, one thing is someone has removed the hard drive, so that's actually a good thing because I don't need extra ID hard drives. And ultimately, you hope that recyclers are taking hard drives out of things. You don't want the data of whoever this computer belonged to floating around on the internet. I mean, I always delete and format the hard drives when I get machines that it was left inside, but not everyone does that. Some people might be unscrupulous and maybe they're going to find personal revealing information, upload it to the internet, release it to the media, whatever, right? It should just be destroyed. I'll show a better close up in a second, but this is a 46DX. I can see the processor sitting right there. It does not have a heatsink on it. Let's go through these cards, take a look at what we find in here. All right, we're gonna start at the bottom here. So this is the video card. And right away, I can tell this due to the length that this is a local bus video card. And we have a Cirrus Logic GD5424 graphics processor. Now, this is not a 3D accelerated card by any means, but what this is, is a 2D accelerated card meaning that once you install the video drivers, this thing is doing the blitter operations and things like that, which means even at high color modes, scrolling in Windows is super fast. Like there's no slowdown while it's scrolling, even when you're running potentially in 256 colors or even 16 bit color, which this may support. Now this doesn't appear to have a lot of RAM on it because uh, RAM would go here, dip RAM, it has two RAM chips there. So who knows how much this thing actually has. But um, yeah, it's a pretty generic looking card. Here's the back slot cover. Luckily, I, I have plenty of the little uh, bits that go in there so I can reattach that. Okay, next up we have the multi IO card, which is also a Visa local bus card. So it's very long, which means it's hard to get out. Come on. Wow, it's stuck. There we go. I had to use two hands to get that out. And I did take the screw out of um, the little extra cover there. Okay, I'm gonna leave things connected right now because for instance, the LED there, it's not even labeled <laughs> where, where the LED connects. I just labeled this with a Sharpie to say where the LED goes. All right, so there is the multi IO card. So it's a WinVon card. It's got IDE, a single IDE port, which supports hard, two hard drives and we have floppy drive. And of course we have this cover here, which has the game port and a serial port, not to mention another serial port and a parallel port. There are configuration jumpers here, which it's the card is not labeled, so you don't know what's what. It just has JP numbers, but hopefully the game port is disabled. Yeah, so really nothing much to report on this, just a bog standard multi IO. This was pretty much found in every 486 board. The only thing of note is, that, of course, it's Visa Local Bus. So yeah, it looks like a PCI connector, but it's not. This is actually a 32 bit direct connection into the processor bus, which bypasses the slow 16 bit ISA for the hard drive controller, really speeding things up. And the video card right there does exactly the same thing. So it offers far more speed. So it might be up to like 33 megahertz at 32 bits versus eight megahertz at 16 bits is far more bandwidth for getting video data or hard drive data in and out of the processor. So that was the benefit of the Visa local bus. And unlike PCI, this is literally connected directly to the processor bus. There is no arbitration. There's no bus controllers or anything in between. And really, um, there are two slots on this motherboard. I think two or three was the limit due to noise issues on the bus coming from connecting cards like this. Incidentally, if you have one of these cards and you have a motherboard that doesn't have this connector, you can actually still use this card. I think the hard drive controller won't work, but the IO ports and the floppy controller work perfectly and they work off of this part of the card. In fact, I don't even think you even need this part. You can stick this in an eight bit slot and you will have functional floppy controller and uh, serial parallel ports just off the 8-bit portion. 
Okay, so this sound card is next, and I really don't know what this is. I'm gonna unplug the audio cable that goes to the CD-ROM drive, that's what that is. What is this card? Look at the back here, it's all yellow. The, the CD-ROM drive is connected to it, but what is this card? All right, so I think what we're looking at here is a Pro Audio Spectrum card from Media Vision. And if I blow the, take the dust off there, yep, it says Media Vision there, MW, and it says Spectrum. I think that's what this is. Now, it has a Yamaha OPL chip, and it's right there. So this does have ad-lib sound through the Yamaha chip, so it's not emulated through one of these chips. It's true OPL 2 or 3. It's a YMF262-M chip. So either way, that's a real Yamaha chip. And then right here, this is that connector that went to that CD-ROM drive. So I guess this supported at least that particular CD-ROM drive. I'm not sure if this was a bundle that came with it or what the deal was. I don't think I ever had one of these cards back in the day. I had Sound Blasters and then I had a Gravis Ultrasound, a Sound Blaster 16, a few other Creative Labs cards. Never had a Pro Audio Spectrum. So I will have to do a little reading about what this card is all about, what its claim to fame is, but certainly has a lot of ICs on it. And when we look closely at the back here, besides the game port, we have a microphone in, out, and in. That's all it says, basically. This is almost surely not plug-and-play compatible. This is this will have manual configuration. Plug-and-play came with Windows 95 and IC 1993. Date codes on this card. And the last card is the modem. And sure enough, this is pretty boring. Has a Rockwell chip on here. Nothing much happening on the back. Ultimately, modems are a pretty boring thing, internal ones, because can't really use them right now. I mean, you can if you do some kind of craziness, hooking up another, two modems together, stuff like that. But ultimately, they're pretty much useless. Serial ports are more useful. If I lift this up, you'll see there are two Visa Local Bus slots. There is the 46 processor, 46DX, in a ZIF socket. And it does have a NICAD battery right here. And luckily, just like in the leading edge, it does not appear to have leaked. That's incredible. I do want to mention there that you can see that the numeric display in the case is not installed. It would be sitting right there. There are two little standoffs. So unfortunately, we won't be seeing the cool numeric display not on this thing. Okay, I'm going to remove this so I can uh, clean it because there's a bit of dust where the battery is. It's preventing me from telling if it's leaked or it's just dust that has come in the keyboard port. One thing I do not miss about these old pre-ATX cases is the way they mount it in the case. There are two screws usually that hold it on right by the slots, the ones I just took out, but the rest of the motherboard is on little plastic slider things. So you kind of have to slide it down. Actually, this thing is not coming out. It's possible that the motherboard tray on this case unscrews. I need to look at the other side, but um, oh, there's actually one loose screw inside the computer. Oh, that probably came from the hard drive whenever they ripped the hard drive out. Yeah, so see how the motherboard is sliding around, but I still can't lift it up because there are little white standoffs that it's slotted into the motherboard tray. So I'm gonna flip this on its side. Yeah, okay, this is one of the better designs. So it's got screws here. So you can take these off to get the whole tray out, which means getting the motherboard in and out of the case is a lot less fiddly. But not every case had this design, um, which meant that these little plastic things, you had to slot it in and it was all just a bit difficult. Oh, look at that. The motherboard just fell off because I had taken those screws off already. I'm just gonna snap a picture of the way that these cables are connected right here. So when I go to reconnect them, I don't have to struggle as much. The motherboard itself is labeled, but what's nice about taking a picture is the polarity for the LEDs and stuff. I can see which way to reconnect this and it just saves time in the future. All right, let's take a closer look at this motherboard here. So there is our Intel processor. We have a 486DX33. So not particularly fast, but hey, I guess when this thing came out, it was probably a nice upgrade. We have cache memory. We have the main chipset here, which is from Contact, made in Germany, which is kind of cool. Date codes on these chips look to be around 1993. There are the memory slots, 30 pin SIMs, might have up to eight megabytes in here, but this could be five megabytes, could be two megabytes. Just depends on what combination of memory modules are installed. You have to install four at a time when you're dealing with these 30 pin slots. The battery appears to be starting to leak, but I don't think anything has leaked onto the motherboard, which is absolutely amazing. There's just a lot of dust here. It's definitely starting to leak though. So I'm glad I got this thing out of the case right now. But yeah, 
That's amazing. This thing is going to be saved, I think. Made in the USA. Not something you see very often anymore. And there it is, Galaxy V3. It's really the only thing I can find on here as far as model numbers go. One thing I'm noticing is the BIOS chip is in the motherboard directly without a socket. That is extremely rude. Like, why is the keyboard controller in a socket but that not? That seems pretty bad design there. So, um, yeah, anyways, just means it won't be easy just to yank it out and copy it. Snipping the battery out here. Like I said, it's just starting to leak, just. There is a little bit of crust on the side that was facing the keyboard connector. The other side, no, it's fine. And I'm just gonna go over to the sink, hit this with a little IPA, clean that up. There's a little bit of a scratch on the motherboard from the uh, cutters that I just used, but um, that's what it might look like, a little bit of green crust. But that, I don't think that's real. That's just from the uh, fiberglass here. And after cleaning, everything looks pretty good. No damage. That was lucky because like uh, you've probably seen on my channel and plenty of others before, those batteries, they destroy these boards. So if you have an old computer, it's got a NICAD battery, you need to just remove that immediately. Okay, I wanna test this motherboard, but I don't wanna use the power supply that's in the case. Not initially. I wanna test this on a known good power supply. Just in case that power supply is bad, I don't want it to like put a bunch of voltage into this thing. So here is my test bench. So it's got a regular AT power supply under there. And it is just a standard Pentium motherboard here. I don't know, I took this out of an old computer ages ago. And I use this pr primarily for testing things because it has ISA slots, PCI slots. It has onboard IDE, and this is a compact flash to IDE adapter and just plugs straight in the motherboard. And I have gone ahead and modified this motherboard so the power for this thing comes straight off the motherboard. I have a speaker that's attached permanently and I you know, have the fan also powered directly off the motherboard. So I just don't have a bunch of cables and it has two IDE connections and it has a floppy drive port. So it just means it's super easy for testing everything. And this is sort of my preferred test bench. But the good thing is the power supply on this thing works really well, I have no issues with it. So I totally trust it to test this 4E6 board. So I'm gonna move this out of the way and we will just test with the power supply. All right, so for connecting these types of power supplies, you have to have these the right way around. The black wires must be towards the center. And the only thing I can remember the adage is if you have it this way, when, the, when you have it red, you're dead. And I don't know if there's like an equivalent one for the black, like you're black, you're good, or something like that, black is best. Um, but yeah, red is dead. So if you plug these together, it will cause damage, um, at least to the power supply itself. And then to actually get this on here, it's a little bit fiddly because there's these little notchy things. So you just sort of hook it on like that and push down. And you do that with each one of these. It helps if you kind of hook it on first and push it down and there we go, we're connected. Now this power supply is the same type. It has this flying lead, which has a power switch on the end here. And um, of course, this is mains voltage right here. So uh, when I use this, this is not exactly safe because this thing's just sort of floating around like this but I am careful when I flip this power switch to do this. Plus I ensure that these little rubber boots here are all the way covering these connectors. So these connectors aren't exposed at all. Um, although once this is plugged into mains, I still am wary of this part of the thing. Ideally, I should probably get a piece of large heat shrink or hot glue and somehow glue this together and make it sort of a solid block or maybe a little 3D printed shroud. I don't know, something like that. But um, right, for now, I just uh, let this hang over the edge and I am careful with it. So first I'm gonna connect this video card to the motherboard. I'll plug it into the same slot that it was in. Now, since these cards are so long, they are not easy to get in, especially when the motherboard's not mounted. There we go, so it's in there. But yeah, you gotta push it in like really firmly to get that in. So that's just the way they are, unfortunately. I'm using the NEC LCD there, so we'll plug this into the card. And I will need an AT keyboard, so I'm gonna use this PS2 HP keyboard, and I have an adapter on here. All right, and with that, I am ready to turn the power on. Here we go. The fan in here does not work very well. Sometimes it makes noise. Hey, there we go, we have an image. Let's hit pause. Okay, it, it stopped anyways. All right, so at the top of the screen, we have the BIOS for the Cirrus Logic video card, the 5424, I think it is. It's made by Quadtel and Cirrus Logic combined. 1993 decode 
And then we have the AMI BIOS from this machine here, 1993 as well, made in USA, very proudly proclaimed there. So the computer has two megs of RAM, which is odd to me. I would expect a machine with eight SIMs to be populated to either have two megabytes, five megabytes, or eight megabytes, not six megabytes. It doesn't really make sense because these look like 256 modules here. So that would be one megabyte. And what is this? This is five megabytes? Like what? That's, that doesn't seem possible. So I, I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Anyhow, I'm gonna hit F1 to go into the setup. There it is. There is the green, purple, and orange setup utility. So common back in the day with these particular motherboards. Standard settings doesn't have a whole lot to look at. There is a nice calendar there. Like if you're gonna look at the calendar, I guess. I always wondered why that was in there exactly. Anyhow, you got the two hard drive types. You can set custom types, but this does not support large disks. This BIOS, I think its limit is 512 megabytes. For the floppy drive, we have the usual four choices. Oh, five choices up to 2.88 megabytes. I have never owned a 2.88 meg drive. I think that was called ED, enhanced density. I never owned one of those, never seen one. I don't really know, but it's in a lot of these BIOSes, so obviously it was around, but yeah, you have the various color settings. So defaults to VGA, because that's what's in here. And you can say keyboard installed or not. The only real difference is it says down here is it tests the keyboard or not. It won't give you a keyboard error if you disable it there, if you try to boot the machine without a keyboard. Looking here in advanced settings, we can test the upper memory. Uh, there is a few other generic -y settings like floppy drive boot. It was nice. This was like one of the early days where you could set the C drive to boot overriding the A drive. So if you left a disk in there, you would not get non-system disk errors, which plagued many a people. In fact, it was just the other day that I got tricked on my own Windows 10 computer because I left a floppy disk in there and it tried to boot and it, I thought the hard drive got erased and I realized it was a disk in the drive and I, yeah, anyhow. So that was cool. External cache memory, that's those cache chips that are on the motherboard. And you can do some shadow RAM stuff for your video and your system ROM, which really increases the performance of the entire system when you do that. Basically copies the ROM into the very fast 32-bit memory and it accesses it directly from there. There is advanced chipset in here. Let's take a look here. All right, so there's some auto config. Looks like you can set the frequency of the CPU. It's running at 50 megahertz. That was what it was set to there. So that's kind of fun. There's no jumpers. And I just realized there are no jumpers on here. So this is a 33 megahertz machine. So I should probably set it to the correct thing. You can set the uh, SRAM, which is the cache memory weight states. And then here's the DRAM weight states. And then there's this cacheable stuff here for the system and BIOS ROMs. So let me reboot this computer with it set for 33 megahertz. I don't want to be overclocking this CPU because it has no heat sink on it. Eight megs of RAM. Okay, so why was it detecting it wrong originally? Maybe because it was overclocking the CPU. I'm not sure. Eight megs of RAM, that makes a lot more sense. Six megs didn't make sense. Was I just misreading that earlier? Hmm. This BIOS has an auto detect hard drive, so it detects the heads and cylinders for you, which is nice. Doesn't really work well with large hard drives though. And there's a hard drive utility where it lets you format the hard drive and stuff. If you have one installed, obviously there isn't. So there is not much to do. Let's just reboot one more time. Hopefully that eight megabytes sticks. 8,064K, it's a little weird. It's lost a little bit of memory and now it's trying to boot, but obviously there's no <laughs> disk drive, so that's not gonna work, but it has 256K of cache memory. Off camera, I gave this motherboard a further test and it's absolutely working great. So time to reinstall this back into the original case and turn this into a computer that actually boots. What you're about to see can be considered a PC building tutorial, at least for this era of computer. First thing to do is we're gonna mount the motherboard back onto this plate. Now, a lot of cases don't have this removable part. This is just inside. So the same procedure is gonna apply. It's just gonna be very fiddly because you're gonna have to do it inside the case. But with this one, we can do it outside. So you'll notice these slot looking things on the motherboard. There are two metal standoffs here, but everything else has these slots. And these are the little white standoffs that connect into the motherboard and you push them into the holes and you'll see it's got sort of a flat part with that little bottom piece. And that's what goes into these little slots. And when you push them like that, it's actually held into place. And predominantly motherboards are held in with this method. Now, like I said, these two are regular screw standoffs, which help, but sometimes these are the plastic ones as well, but you usually have at least one or two of these. And that keeps the motherboard in place. So when you 
move the computer around, it doesn't just flop around, but the cards hold it in, as do these metal standoffs. So the first thing you have to do is you have to look at all the holes on the motherboard and make sure that you have the plastic standoffs installed into all of the spots that are going to align with the base plate. And the way you do that is you just hold it like this and you look down and you can look through the hole and you can see the slot. Now, these were already on here, so I know they're in the right spot, but this one here in my hand, it had fallen out of this corner piece. Basically, what you're gonna do is you're going to put the motherboard down into these holes, you're gonna try to, and then you're gonna slide it that way, which will lock it in, right? Like this. Now on this one, it's extra easy because we can flip this around like that and I can just very easily see that these are installed into the right slots, and they are. Um, there's not one there. There's nothing over here. The motherboard doesn't go down far enough to hit those. And this is all good. Those are there. So that was really easy. You can imagine if you have a big motherboard or you're inside a case, that's not so simple sometimes. And the fact that there are two screws means that this motherboard is now held in there pretty tightly. I didn't mention this earlier, but I installed two pins where the old battery was just so I could connect a CR2032 in a holder. It will need a diode because this is expecting a rechargeable battery, so it sends five volts into the battery when the computer is running. So don't just hook up a, a non-rechargeable battery, but you could also hook up like a any 3.7 volt battery up to there, like say from a, a cordless phone, something like that, NICAD batteries, but they still have potential to leak, so I really don't advise it. One other tidbit is this motherboard has a crystal oscillator there for the CPU speed, it, uh, I thought it had jumpers, but the jumpers don't seem to be populated because on the instructions I found for this motherboard online shows you have jumpers for the speed, but clearly not because it's a 33 megahertz crystal and there are just permanent things installed where those jumpers go. So I guess this thing is fixed at 33 megahertz. Although if you install a 46DX266 processor in this, it still uses the same 33 megahertz bus as this, but it doubles it internal to the CPU. So it is possible to speed this thing up by just swapping that CPU. But I'm gonna leave it as is right now at 33 megahertz. I'd like to turn my attention to the computer case a little bit before I reassemble it. There's just a little bit of dust in here, so I'm just gonna give this thing a quick clean with a vacuum cleaner and a cloth. Just make this look nice again. I just did a very quick clean, but this thing cleaned up very nicely. I mean, all things considered, I think this computer was from 93, so 27 years old. It's in incredible condition. Time to reconnect all of the front panel connections and I'm using my handy dandy picture I took earlier. Then inserting the motherboard, you just sort of slot that in and reinstall the two screws. Connecting the power supply, you just make sure the black wires are towards the center. That's the very important thing to always remember. I took an old card out of my dead parts bin and I stole the nuts off there so I could reinstall the back slot cover. And then inserting it into the motherboard is pretty typical. But as I mentioned before, it's really hard to get these cards into the slots, so I had to actually support the motherboard tray underneath while I pushed the card in because it was bending. I'll be using a 128 megabyte compact flash card with a little compact flash to IDE slot adapter in this machine. So the compact flash adapter requires the smaller connector like a floppy drive, so I'm gonna use this adapter here because the power supply only appears to have one additional cable, which was connected to the hard drive. So we're gonna use the adapter to connect it to the compact flash card. And I got these from eBay and they're very inexpensive ones and um, they don't work very well. It can be very difficult to get the connector on. There we go. And sometimes the cables pull out as well. The CD-ROM drive has this cable, which actually just unplugged from the back of the drive and I noticed that it just sort of fell off the back of the drive. So I'm glad I checked that because I might have been trying to troubleshoot a problem that was simply the cable being disconnected. On the sound card, there's a number one that's up towards the top side of the card and the stripe, which is green on this cable, goes towards that number one. And there's also an audio cable, which comes off the CD-ROM drive. And on this card, there is only one place to put that cable. Unfortunately, there's a bird's nest of ribbon cables in this computer, and that's just a fact of life with these old types of machines. These cables are just not easy to route and cable manage. So I'm trying to put the sound card back in this slot right here, and it doesn't work there because the compact flash adapter is too close. So I'm gonna have to move it over one slot, 
And I hope this works because even though this motherboard has a good number of slots on it, all the way up to here, the drive cage sticks out. And for a card like this sound card, it's quite long. It actually prevents it from using these slots closer to the power supply. And in fact, I can't even use this one, I don't think. Oh, maybe I can just get it in. Okay, yeah, that is that is just working. And that's because this ribbon cable that comes off the card just is right up against the, the drive cage. All right, all the cards are back in the computer. And yeah, I know it looks messy, but you can spend a lot of time trying to cable manage these old systems. No one's gonna be looking inside of this computer. So the fact that it's like this, this is how all computers were back then. You saw it was exactly like this when I opened it up. Off camera, I took a CR2032 battery holder and I connected a shock key diode to it and then ran some wires to the motherboard to supply battery power to it to keep settings. Okay, time for a test. Everything is connected to the computer. Everything is back in there as it should be. And here we go. Seems normal. All right, it says CMOS battery state low and display mismatch. I think that is simply because the battery was low and then I plugged it back in. So it's giving me that error. But once I enter setup, it shouldn't give me that problem anymore. So let me try using the auto detect hard disk option because that compact flash card is connected and it should be detected. And there it is, 122 megabytes. That is perfect, except yes. There is no second hard drive, so I can just skip over that and hit yes. And now I need to go through and set up all these options in here. All right, time and date are set. Hard drive was automatically set as we did before. It's actually very helpful because I don't really know the heads and cylinders for compact flash card. Probably could have figured it out somehow, but to be honest, it's actually a very helpful feature. I do know that this top disk drive has the twist on the cable. So this is the A drive and this is the B drive. So we're gonna set 1.2 megabytes there and 1.4 there, keyboard installed. Let's check the advanced settings. Why don't we keep the memory test on for above one megabyte? Let's do floppy drive seek. We'll leave the boot sequence as A and C and the rest of this stuff looks good. And I'll just set this for automatic configuration and we will put cacheable on yes and yes. And that's it. We're gonna hit enter, save and press enter. Now the compact flash card I stuck in here, I've already formatted that with DOS 622, copied some stuff onto it. So it is actually ready to boot. It should boot this machine right up. Let's see what happens. Seems like we're having a problem here. And we got an error, floppy drive and hard drive controller failure. I am gonna poke around in there, see what's going on. I bet you that hard drive controller is not in the slot all the way. What I'm gonna do is hold the metal plate on the back and I'm going to just push the card into the slot, make sure that it's fully in there. And let's see if that helped at all. It's funny it said hard drive controller failure because it auto detected it. So it's obviously seen the compact flash card. There we go. It seeked that B drive error. Okay, I need to check B drive. Maybe it's unplugged. Uh, but yeah, this fact that it seeked and it didn't say hard drive error, good sign. Yep, this is the floppy cable. This is where the three and a half inch drive would be connected. And obviously it was just loose in there. So either I unplugged it or it got unplugged when they took the hard drive out of this computer. I feel bad for anyone with large hands. My hands are, are sort of average size. I can get inside of computer cases like this without too much difficulty. All right, let's try that again. There we go, both of them seeked. That's a great sign. Is it gonna boot the hard drive? Great, now this isn't working. <laughs> this is like a comedy of errors, this computer. What is going on? I know the compact flash card is formatted and should boot this computer. I've already tested it and it does boot. So now I gotta go fiddle around. I probably plugged in a cable wrong. So it booted up and I don't know why. I took this out, I just checked the cables, everything was connected. I checked the card that was in there and it was and, and I turned it on and it booted right into DOS. So it must've just been a loose connection. So I'm gonna reinstall this into the machine. All right, let's see if it works now. Turn this on. Hopefully it boots right up without any issues. The CMOS battery seems to be working. I haven't had it lose its setting. No complaints about 
Lack of settings. All right, and it's booting right up. I'm gonna go and run Speed 600. It's the landmark speed test. And people criticize this program for being crap, and it is crappy, but what I like about it is the real-time nature of it. So it's good for testing the turbo button functionality on your machine. So currently it says 158 megahertz. It's a 33 megahertz machine, but it is the equivalent of 158 megahertz IBM PCAT. And the reason for that is because of the cache memory and stuff. Now the turbo button is out. Now when I push it in, it now says 68.7 megahertz. And yeah, and I actually prefer when the turbo button is the other way around, when you push it in to actually speed up the computer, make it run at full speed, turbo, so to speak, as opposed to out, which is the slow speed. Now on this machine, by the way, it says 68 megahertz when the turbo is off. If I run speed test again, it still says the machine is 33 megahertz, but yet it says 68 megahertz. And I think it's not actually changing the clock speed. It's probably introducing wait states or disabling the cache memory, something along that effect, which has the, has the effect of slowing down the machine, but it doesn't really change the clock speed. So the machine appears to be working fine, so far at least. I'm gonna put the top cover on this thing and button it up, and then we'll take a look at some software. You can see the Windex bottle there. I gave the top cover a good clean and used some magic eraser to get scuffs off. It cleaned up really well. There are some scratches in the paint, but you know, what can you do, right? You can put in six screws in the back cover. I always just put in four. And there it is, the computer's all together. It's working really nicely. As you see, I have Windows 3.11 Windows for Workgroups installed on here which is perfectly time appropriate. I think this OS is right around the 1993 time period, as was this machine. So I installed the Pro Audio Spectrum drivers in Windows, and it totally seems to work with this card, even though it's called a Thunder Audio Spectrum. Let's run Chips Challenge here. So as you heard, absolutely working music. Yeah, so the MIDI sound comes through the OPL synthesizer and it sounds great. And of course the digital sound is working fine as well. Now a few different mixers got installed. There's a pocket mixer, which is this one. It looks a little bit more fancy. You can kind of turn these uh, volumes on and off. I guess mute, unmute, stuff like that. But there's also this one here, which allows you to really access all the various channels on this card. I've exited Windows and I found game compatibility to be a little bit mixed. And I don't know, I think it's this card versus a real Pro Audio Spectrum. If I run Cyber, which is a breakout style game, it has working music, but for weird reason, it's very fast. I've exited the game, so I don't have to talk over the music. So it seems that the music's working fine, which is OPL3 audio, works perfectly fine, as you heard. Just the speed is a bit weird. Now that could be just because the computer's too slow, because the game plays really slow once you're actually playing it, but the music's fast in the menu, so. But then what's weird is if I run Planet X3 and I pick AdLib as the sound, we have no sound. We have the PC beep speaker, but where's the AdLib sound? But if we look, there is a blaster string and it has A220. That's the address of the OPL synthesizer on this card. Obviously, Cyber is working with it, but Planet X3 is not. And one more thing, I'm gonna pick PC speaker on here and the sound is gonna come out of the amplified speakers on its own. It's obviously picking it up off the ISA bus, but it sounds terrible, listen. Okay, enough of that because it sounds horrible. It's completely out of tune. I'm not sure how the card is picking up the PC audio off the bus, but it is. So for simple clicks and stuff, it's okay. But for any kind of tones, it really sounds bad. If we take a look at Doom here, here's the setup version 1.7. So it allows us to pick Pro Audio Spectrum as the music card. And for the sound card, we can also pick Pro Audio Spectrum. I'm just gonna pick that. And if we run Doom, all right, well, this is weird because yesterday the music wasn't working at all, but it sounds like it's working fine now. All right, I've turned down the speaker. So I was about to say that the music is not working in this game, and yesterday it was not, but maybe I had the mixer volume turned all the way down. I'm not sure because I would run Cyber, it would work, Exit Road of Doom, and it wouldn't work, but here it is working fine, and so is the sound. Um, I have the speakers turned down, but let me tell you, the digital audio works fine. Now, being a 4633, this thing doesn't run super great. Its frame rates are very slow. And there's one other interesting thing with this video card. I'm not sure how well it comes across in the camera, 
But a lot of games have this white bar along the bottom, but not all games. I definitely saw some stuff yesterday running at 320 by 240 where there was no bar, but yet there's one in Doom and most games in this resolution have that bar. So not too sure what the deal is with that, but that's obviously something weirdly incompatible with this Sirius Logic card. Rebooting the computer shows a problem here. The CD-ROM drive needs the sound card driver to work, right, because it's plugged into the sound card. But the original Pro Audio Spectrum drivers I installed are looking for a SCSI interface, which of course doesn't exist because this CD-ROM drive is not SCSI. I searched online for drivers for this specific card, so this is the Pro Audio Spectrum one that's not working, and I really can't find anything for the Thunder Audio 16. So if you happen to see any drivers around that have a CD-ROM driver that should work, please let me know. Since I'm filming this on Christmas Eve, I'm gonna run the Sierra Christmas card and see if this works. Fortunately, I don't hear any audio. All right, unfortunately, I figured out the DOS mixer. I have everything turned up to 100%. The speakers are quite loud. And even in the, in the demo here, I have the sound turned all the way up. And if I hit OK, there is sound. It's just very quiet. Uh, that same white bar is visible on the bottom of the screen coming from the video card. So unfortunately, that's one of the problems with these types of cards is they just don't work super reliably. I have Galaxy Music Player here, which is a DOS mod player. Let's see what this, how this works. It should be working with Sound Blaster emulation. And it froze. Great, so that doesn't work very reliably. Things like the Pro Audio Spectrum, even back in the day, had somewhat mixed compatibility. Yeah, there are games and programs out there that support it natively, um, like Doom did, but not everything does. And if you're going to try to rely on the emulation, it, it just can be problematic sometimes. It even says here, playing on Pro Audio Spectrum, volume 100%, mixing speed 22 kilohertz. So this obviously is supporting the Pro Audio Spectrum natively, and yet it just freezes when you try to play something. So I don't know if this is a problem with the compatibility on this particular fake card, it's not a real Pro Audio Spectrum or what, but I've always found that this mod player works flawlessly playing stuff on Sound Blasters. Even though I can't get the CD-ROM drive working, I'm gonna put this Windows NT 4.0 CD in here. I just wanna see if it at least spins up the disc. The light's flashing. Let me listen. Yep, the disc is definitely spinning in there. I think this is a single speed CD-ROM drive, 1X. So the disc is just spinning at 300 RPM, 300 to 400 RPM, something like that. So it's not a fast drive, but it was inexpensive compared to some of the Caddy ones, if I recall. All right, back in Windows, I wanted to demonstrate the video accelerator that's in here. So currently I am just using the standard VGA driver, 16 colors. There's no driver installed for the Cirrus Logic card. Here's a program called Torque, which says it accurately measures the system's bitmap blitting performance, and even in the presence of systems which cheat, in quotes, okay, whatever that is. Let's see what this does. All right, there are the results, 4.1 million on this top one and 1.9 on the bottom one. Let's install the driver and take a look at how that changes. All right, a trip to Vogons and I found the right driver for this card. So let me quickly install it and then we can run the tests on here. All right, here's the set resolution. 640 by 480, 256 colors, DOS, Windows. That's what we're gonna do. Hit okay, here we go. Crash or no crash? Yes, it worked. Awesome. And here we go. All right, well, it doesn't look to be going specifically faster, but we have to remember that it's actually pushing around a lot more information because we're running in 256 color mode now. And there it is, confirmed a lot faster. 8.8 .8 million on that one was 4.1 the first time. And this one down here is 2.7 right now. And we were at 1.9 last time. Let me change the resolution to 1024 by 768 at 256 colors, which will be the native resolution I have of this LCD screen. <laughs> or not, out of range, this thing. This, there's no way to even see information on this screen to know what resolution we're actually in right now. Uh, so we're going back to VGA driver to get Windows working. It's kind of cool in a way that's easy to fix if you know what to do. A little bit easier than say Windows um, 95 started using the registry and it got a lot harder. If you screwed up a driver, you could end up really screwing things up. Why don't we try 640 by 480 at 24-bit uh, color here, 16 million colors. Awesome, it's working, although check out how slow it redraws the screen. 
So clearly, even though I said this is an accelerated video card, it's not that accelerated. It's just faster than an ISA card because it has that Visa local bus connectivity directly to the CPU. But you'll see that it's quite chug-a-lug. Here in MS Paint, though, we can pick from any color, though. Of course, because this has all 24-bit color available. There's no dithering going on with any of these uh, slightly different non-VGA colors that are happening here, right? Even in Chip's Challenge here, things are going a little slow. Ultimately, if I had this card back in the day, I would probably be running it at 256 colors. I don't think anything really ever used high color mode, and that gives you the best possible performance on a card like this. And I'm gonna end this video here. This little dumpster find, so to speak, PC, turned out to be a pretty nice little computer. I'd like to get the CD-ROM drive working, but even with that, the fact I have the compact flash card makes it really easy to get software on and off of this thing. I can just stick it into my compact flash reader on my main computer, but this machine works perfectly. Considering it was that close to being scrapped, I think it's got a little second lease on life. A 33 megahertz 46 is not the fastest thing in the world. As you saw, it sort of struggled even to play that cyber game. And I played a bunch of other games on here. And some of the older stuff all works totally fine. But that sound card actually is the biggest letdown being not really super compatible. Luckily, I have other computers that have better sound cards like Sound Blaster 16s and faster processors and everything else. So it's not like I need this computer to work perfectly, but I'm just, I'm glad to have rescued it. I'm glad to have cleaned it up and I'm glad that it's working. So if you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up, but if you didn't, you know what to do. And of course, hit that subscribe button to subscribe to my channel with the little bell icon for notifications. It really helps me when you do that. And then put your comments, your questions down in the comment section below. And that's gonna be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and a happy new year and a happy holidays to everyone. And I'll see you next time. Goodbye.